Good afternoon and welcome back to a Better Jamaica's series, Meet the Candidates of Council District 27 Queens. I'm your host, Gail Lewis, and it is my pleasure right now to introduce one of the candidates for District 27 in Queens. He is Jason Clark. Good afternoon, Candidate Clark. Hi, good afternoon, Gail. It's nice to see you again. It's always great to see you. Thank you. And thanks for um, coming over and agreeing to do this today. Um, these candidate forums, AKA another chance to strut your stuff are put together so that we can have a little bit more of an in-depth conversation. And we are focusing on you, the candidate, who you are, your story, your values, your background, and your vision for District 27. We ask that you answer instead of in sound bites or instead of in bullet points, answer in your story, okay? Sounds good, that sounds good. Great, let's get started. Every good story, uh, well, every good fairy tale starts with, <laughs> how does this story? <laughs> it starts with once upon a time, sorry. I was about to say once upon a time. <laughs> And that really nice like lettering for the T, you know, yes, or the yes, O. Once upon a time. Uh, so we'll start there. Once upon a time, candidate Clark. Um, where were you born and who were you born to? Yeah, sure. So, well, I was born right here in uh, Jamaica, Queens. I was born to uh, uh, Camille Clark and Luther Clark. And, uh, and I also have a uh, sister, uh, Monica Clark, who's uh, two years uh, younger than me. Oh, okay, so you answered my next question. Too. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. That's great. Um, how did you guys get along growing up? Because uh, she's how much? She's two years younger. She's two years younger. Two years younger. Well, that's right. Good. That's a good. That's a good age, but still a little bit of sibling rivalry, or no? Yeah, you know, we got along. <laughs> excuse me, pretty well, uh, especially when I hear some of these other stories <laughs> and see some other siblings. Um, you know, she was, uh, I was like, you know, she was always smarter than me. So things, you know, kind of came up, you know, pretty easy. So she was, um, uh, Monica is very precocious and uh, uh, she's an attorney uh, as well. She lives in uh, uh, Chicago right now. In fact, uh, actually, after this whole election is over, I'm going to be able to go down because it's, uh, she just got married and uh, they're having the ceremony in August. So, you know, it's, uh, it'll really be um, great to be able to connect again on some of those things but uh yeah no we've always got along pretty well congratulations to your family that's a great that's you know it's just such a milestone and especially after covid now you guys can all travel together that's awesome. exactly exactly right because it was supposed to be last year but obviously just like covid's been the big asterisk to everything you know that was happening in uh 2020 so you and your sister grew up where in the district Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we grew up um, here in Jamaica. And, uh, you know, the funny thing about it for me is my story actually really starts um, with my mother, uh, which actually also really starts with my grandparents. So, you know, all of them, um, they actually grew up in uh, Springfield Gardens. Uh, really? Dallas. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, my uh, grandparents, they, uh, they moved up here from Atlas, Georgia. Uh, way back in during the uh, Great Migration in the 1950s. Wow, and, they were uh, homeowners in the 1950s in Springfield Gardens. Yeah, yeah, it took some time. It took some time to be able to get there, but they did. You know, my grandfather, he, um, you know, he was a porter, you know, with the MTA. And wow. he was actually a part Flashback. of one of the... Yes, oh, yes, definitely. And uh, he was uh, one of, a part of one of the first Black uh, unions they had at that time. And, you know, my mother always tells me about how you know, my grandparents in particular, they were very conservative, right? They didn't spend a whole lot of money or eat out a whole lot, do those type of things. Uh, and it's because of that, that, you know, even though they didn't come up here with a lot, they're able to save enough and be able to have a home. So, you know, again, I guess my grandfather, you know, he was with the MTA. Uh, my uh, grandmother, she got a job um, um, providing unemployment benefits uh, here actually in Jamaica, Queens. And, uh, you know, they raised my mom. And- awesome. um, Is your mom an only child? Yes, yeah, she is. Yeah, she's, oh, a, wow. she's the only child. I uh, and my father, I'm sorry? I love that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and my father, uh, he actually uh, grew up in um, in uh, Florida, which is funny because whenever I'm on the campaign trail, you know, with the last name like Clark, one of the things that I must get asked at least twice a day is like, "Are you related to Barbara Clark?" 
was oh, like, no, that's no. True. Yeah. <laughs> um, my Southeast Queens root side is actually on my on my maternal side. Um, but uh, but at the same time, you know, just like a uh, former assembly member um, Barbara Clark, you know, big ed, um, I, um, advocate of education. Um, but I, I guess to where I was going with this is uh, when I was a kid, my mother was concerned that I was starting to fall behind in my public school. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll get to schooling oh, in just a moment. Yes, but but no let's just uh, let's just stick with um, mom, mom, mom and grew up in Springfield <laughs> Gardens, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And grandparents, mom's parents, uh, when did they purchase their house in in? I'm always interested in those stories in Springfield Gardens. Do you know? <gasps> Geez, I don't know, but I will find out. And I don't know, we could put it in the uh, notes or something and like that. is it still in the family? No, no. Oh. So the funny thing about it is, um, so they ended up, well, my mother ended up selling the house after my uh, my parents, or you know, both my grandparents had passed away. Right. Uh, I guess maybe about 15 years ago. And the crazy thing is, you know, it's right on, if you know, you know, for anyone who's watching this, who knows a Springfield Garden, it's uh, right on the corner of like Williamson Avenue and Grayson. And it's like a completely different house there. So they completely oh, wow. raised, and there's something else that's there. Yeah. yeah. So aside from kind of looking a little bit in the backyard and remembering a few things like that, it looks a little different. Um, but that is a good question. You know, I will find out. Okay, no, no pressure, just interested. No, always myself. interested in the back in the backstory. Mm -hmm. Um, so you and your sister, uh, where was your where was the house you grew up in? Yeah, so the house that I grew up on, it was actually right off of uh, Hillside Avenue. Okay. You know, so I've been over like right at the edge, I guess technically of where the city council uh, district um, is, and um, yeah, you know, it was um, it was a uh, a nice way to um, grow up. You know, my you know, for my folks, you know, education was always a big thing. And they really invest in us to make sure that we had an opportunity to be able to get a, uh, a quality education. And- uh, Are your parents still living there or, are they, or have they moved on? No, no, so they, so they themselves have moved on, but actually my godparents, they're the ones who are, are still in the district. Uh, they actually live in uh, Addisley Park. So uh, not too far over there as well, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah. You know, like um, for them, you know, education was a big thing for me. And, and so, uh, so then let's segue into that. Uh, yeah. Where did you go to uh, grammar school, middle school, high school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I ended up going to uh, 221 um, for, uh, for public school and then uh, MS 67 for um, for. Um, Where is middle 67? School. I can't. So that's very that. close. It's kind of closer to, it's actually in Little Neck. So it's in Little Neck with, oh, uh, Little Neck. Okay. right, right. It's one of the zone schools, I guess, for Cardozo. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I went to uh, Bronx Science for high school and then uh, Princeton and uh, Michigan for uh, college levels. Awesome. So Bronx Science, um, what was your favorite uh, class? Oh, definitely American history. Wow. I, I had always been American history um, buff. Uh, you know, it's, it's to me that the thing going on a little bit of a, of a kind of a, a rant right now, it's so interesting to me that, you know, Hamilton has been so big because I always love Alexander Hamilton. Oh, give me a break. Know, really? Like, or are you just saying that because no, it's a, a that. famous totally Broadway play now? Yeah, I know, right? You know, I was just now like, man, sudden, if he didn't get shot, him. he definitely would have become president one day. But he had done so much when it comes to like creating like the first bank. And if you read some of like the Federalist Papers or some of the original papers, uh, you know, uh, first general and then president, really President Washington, it was at that time that he really looked to Hamilton for so much uh, when things were uh, getting started. And it was interesting because a lot of folks, you know, he kind of had this like egalitarian way to him, but he actually came from like pretty uh, humble beginnings, uh, you know, himself. And, uh, but despite all that, he was able to make a way for himself and, uh, you know, play such a huge role in developing, you know, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the framework for, um, you know, for our country. Yeah. 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 I love that. So uh, American history favorite, mm -hmm. even though I went to Bronx science, American history was my favorite. Right. That's true. Yeah. Now, the very thing, now, if you ask me what my least favorite subject was. As you know, that it begs the question, what was the least favorite? Uh, oh, it would be physics. And then probably after that, like chemistry, you know, okay. biology was nice. Uh, All right. I like biology. I'm not sure biology likes me, you know, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but def I, like I was definitely not a science person, right. you know, myself, okay. you know, really more of the liberal arts. Yeah. All right. 
Well, you, you found that out in an early age. You graduated from Bronx Science, great school, and then you went to? Uh, oh, yeah, and then I went to uh, Princeton for college. Nice, and uh, what was your major? American history. <laughs> and favorite, um, since you took a lot of history classes, obviously you were a major, what part of American history were you the most excited about studying when you were uh, at Princeton? Yeah. I mean, for me, it would probably be a little bit of a toss up. One certainly is the, uh, you know, the civil rights movement, you know, being able to learn more about like our history and how, you know, like as a people, we've been able to overcome some of these challenges that, uh, you know, a lot of ways still are with us today. But, you know, the more you hear about those, you know, we came before us, like our, like our grandparents, grandparents, and um, all of the um, just negative things that they had to deal with just to be able to create a life for themselves and just to be able to affirm their own humanity. You know, that's always been something that's um, inspiring. Um, but the second part of that too, which is something, um, I mean, I guess maybe I should have known, but I really, really delved into and liked is just learning more about how our country just got founded. I mean, to me, it's still such a crazy idea. When we think about how hard it is just to pass any law right now, the fact that you can be able to put together just these central tenants that have lasted since 1776. I mean, that's so obviously, you know, there have been amendments and changes, and that certainly wasn't, you know, uh, you know, flawless in any ways. You know, we talk about all these things, especially as it relates to, you know, um, you know, the African American experience out here. But to the extent that these folks with these such varying um, interests and varying backgrounds, you know, could be able to come together at a time to be able to do something that was in the best interest of the whole, as opposed to the one, you know, it, it's, it's still something that's just so remarkable to me. And, uh, you know, I think it's something that, you know, sometimes it's still good to kind of keep in mind when we look about some of these things that, you know, we think makes it a so, so different than, uh, folks who may have different political needs. And the things we take for granted, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. uh, uh, how we have to fight for them. Thank right. you. And okay. then after Princeton, you took your degree. And why did you want to go to law school? You mentioned you went to law school. Why did you want to go to law school with your history degree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, um, the reason why I uh, went to uh, went to law school is because, um, you know, about some of, I guess, my own experiences uh, growing up. So um, the reason I actually went to school over in, um, you know, a different um, school district than mine is because uh, my mother was starting to um, be a little concerned that, you know, I may have been starting to fall behind. And uh, so what they did is they had me take an exam to get into a magnet program. Right. And, um, but unfortunately they didn't want to let me in because uh, I was black. So what she did is she reached out to Councilman Roger Spigner, uh, God rest his soul, who reached out to folks such as, uh, you know, assembly members, borough presidents, she reached out to anyone until finally the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund um, took a look at our case, you know, agreed with my mother and brought a legal action that got me and five other kids of color into that program. Wow. And I'm loving your mom. <laughs> yes, definitely. Advocate. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, how does that shape, how does that shape your view of education right now? Oh, it shapes everything. It shapes everything when it comes to, you know, my my vantage point when I look at the justice system and it, look, it shapes my point when I look at education. I mean, the first thing to me is when you're, whenever I hear these people talking about, you know, there's no systemic racism, you know, they can't see systemic racism. To me, that's a perfect example of systemic racism, right? Where no one should, for example, have to be able to bring a lawsuit just to get a quality education, right? right? And uh, the fact of the matter um, that, you know, folks have to be able to do those things, you know, it's, um, you know, it's just a reminder of how important education can be on the trajectory of somebody's life. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, I'm really looking at this time right now as a moment where we could really be able to re-envision education in our communities. And I say that and because- this time right now, you mean you're running or this period in history or- I mean, June 9th, uh, 2021, <laughs> like right now, this year, this time, you know, aside from all those things. And it's just because, you know, I've always felt that like wherever there is adversity, there's opportunity. And, you know, looking at the, uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the recession, all the social unrest, like 
you know, the one thing that we are looking at now is to try to figure out a way to be able to combat all this learning loss that so many of our students have. Like we're gonna be getting $8.2 billion from the federal government and, this, and the state government collectively that's supposed to be going to New York City education. And even though that's something that's not specifically within city council, it's stuff that's going to like all our kids. And my thinking has always been is if we can be able to use these resources to be able to put together a, um, you know, a framework, all those foundational pieces that can be able to overcome some of those disparities that have haunted like communities like ours for generations, you know, that's how we can be able to make a difference. Like, be able like, to what? Invest like, like um, how should we give me one tangible way we should use that money? Yeah. So the first thing I want to do is uh, make sure that we're investing more like in community schools. Um, we have a, in? Oh, community schools, okay. community schools. I want to make sure that especially for some of our students, you know, who are dealing with things such as food insecurity, who are dealing with issues, you know, maybe at home and they need some of these additional um, support systems so that, you know, when they're in class, they can learn. You know, it's hard to learn when you have all these other things that you have to deal with. And, you know, there are a few community schools, but I, I look at this as an opportunity where we could really be able to expand on that. You know, um, another thing that's really important to me in that vein is making sure that we're being more intentional about being able to help, you know, this group, which I, I kind of call our out of school, out of work youth. You know, right. those folks between like 18 and 25, like, I feel like, you know, nowadays, you know, you he's walking down the street, like on Linden Boulevard or a guy who or whatever, like, I feel like I see so many young folks who are just, you know, around and to the extent that we can be able to do more to ensure that, you know, they can get the skills needed to be able to get a job that can lead to it. So, so how do we do that? Because I have a house full of them living next door. <laughs> like, with, no one has a job. Yeah. So what do we well, do? What do we do for these people who are, you know, 18, I've graduated or maybe I didn't graduate high school and now I'm just kind of, I don't want to work at, you know, fast food or anything because those are hard jobs. I mean, for what you get paid, those are really hard jobs. So right. maybe yeah. I, you know, I, I choose not to do that. Um, or maybe I did that and it just didn't work out for me. So what, what, what's your plan for me? Well, that's certainly where was some of that funding I was talking about, you know, kind of go into. But, you know, I've kind of been tinkering with this idea that I've read a little bit about. It's almost kind of having like a 13th grade, you know, something that's, you know, not certainly required a 13th grade or a fellowship or whatever it is you wanted to call it. But I want to make sure that we have a space where we could be able to bring some of these folks back and be able to say that, you know, let's say you're interested in, uh, you know, going to um, college, right? Um, you know, making sure that maybe, you know, you could have some additional preparation in some of those like core areas so that you can be able to, you know, get into one of these program, a school and be able to do well. And then obviously have some of those services um, to be able to help folks with applying or help folks with getting into these programs. Likewise, you know, for those who are more interested in being able to get a job or career. Right. What out is not my thing? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Figuring out ways to be able to have some partnerships with some of these like vocational opportunities. I want to make sure that we have pipeline opportunities with all of these unions. You know, I mean, a lot of this, I'm sure all the other candidates can talk about, you know, you've got to learn about a ton of unions that are out here in uh, this city. And, you know, I especially want to know is that, you know, if there are unions that are doing work that we're advocating for, which I am advocating for, but like, all our unions that you know are doing work here i want to make sure that there are pipelines for folks who live in our community to be able to get those jobs and expanding those and then working backwards to make sure that at some of our schools that we're building out some of those like apprenticeship type programs um so that folks can be able to lead because my thing is that like from our educational vantage point i feel like the most important thing that we can do is make sure that our students are leaving school and they have some top something lined up for them, whether it's something. going to school. Sorry, whether, oh yeah, something, you know, they have like a plan lined up for them. Okay. So whether it's going to school, whether it's uh, having like a, a job, but you know, we can't just say, all right, well, you know, you graduated or, you know, you're this age or what have you and go forth and figure it out for yourself. Right, um, you know, tried to, that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and uh, I mean, I'm just even thinking back to like, I needed help, like we all need help. And I, I felt like I had, I won the lotto, you know, with my parents and when it comes to education and stuff. So we all need those things. And, um, you know, but I think that we have to be more intentional about making sure that those opportunities are available. Thank you. All right. So let's, let's go back to, um, to uh, 
law school. So you've graduated. Um, what was your first real job after law school? Oh, so my first job, uh, I worked for a uh, law firm called uh, Nixon Peabody. Uh -huh. Where uh, were they? Oh, they're, they're in uh, Midtown Manhattan. And, and what, uh, what, what did you do there? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I joined our commercial litigation firm. Uh, our commercial litigation practice out there. And uh, a lot of what we would do is, you know, figure out ways to be able to, you know, we, you know, we had our clients, you know, they'd find themselves in contractual disputes and what have you. But really, like as a first or first or second year, like you're really just learning how to be a lawyer. Like you're supposed right. to learn it in law school, but you really don't learn it, you know, especially from the litigation. There's, there's that vocational training. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. You know, going out there, making sure you know how to make, you know, interrogatories, document production, you know, all of those things. You're learning all of that. Uh, but, you know, for me, I actually always knew that I wanted to start my career over at the attorney general's office. Um, so, so then what was the step from where you started to uh, where you are now? So tell us where you are now and mm -hmm. what you do there. Yeah. So, well, the first thing I'll say, I actually uh, work right now at a uh, black owned litigation firm called Hamilton Clark. So um, I left, uh, I was at the attorney general's office for nine years, most recently for Tish James. Uh, but as soon as I, I put in my papers to uh, run for office or like, you know, go forth. Uh, by the way, yeah, here's a pitch. Like, <laughs> that's like a, it's, it's a conflict, right? Oh, exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. You don't so want to be bringing in law right. enforcement actions and investigations and have those type of things, which is, you know, the exact, you know, way it should be done. Right. And you um, knew that going in, you know, you yes. knew that when you decided to run. So, right. so you, had, right. you had to leave that position. So what position are you in now? Right. So what I'm doing, I'm at a uh, firm called Hamilton Clark. So it's a uh, black woman. There's that word Hamilton so, again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. And, uh, you know, right now, um, there are a couple of things we're working on. First, uh, we have a federal class action lawsuit in um, in court where we're uh, suing the uh, NYPD on behalf of some of the uh, victims of, uh, or rather some of the protesters from last year's George Floyd protest were the victims of police really? brutality and yeah, uh, false yeah. arrest. Yep. Uh, and then there's also a nonprofit organization that provides early legal intervention um, services to um, folks in communities like uh, like ours. And, you know, I've been being I've been providing some, you know, nonprofit um, uh, counseling on that banish. So so those, so those are the things I'm doing uh, there. Um, but um, but where, when I, where are they physically located? Are they in Manhattan as well? Yeah, well, let's see. So we have an office that's over in, uh, in Manhattan, um, but it's kind of one of those things. It's a very small firm. Like there are four of us, you know, um, let's see. Uh, really get your hands on here, you know, yeah. Yeah, and we all have our different practices, right? So, you know, two of my uh, partners, uh, Phil, uh, Phil Hamilton and uh, Lance, uh, they have um, uh, a strong uh, criminal law practice. And then uh, one of the other um, partners over there, Will, he does a lot of work when it comes to uh, family law, wills and estates and what have you. you know, and then, you know, I do my, uh, you know, I guess justice uh, stuff over here. Right. Uh, work. When, uh, when, you, when you talk about that with the civil rights um, things from last summer, I think um, of that, that horrible uh, picture that we all saw on TV and, and tell me if this is sort of the stuff that you're doing. Um, where there's like a police car driving through a crowd of people and uh, it's protesters and then the police car is just kind of, you know, scattering them. And it was just kind of horrifying yeah. stuff because you're thinking someone's really going to get hurt. Is that right? So protesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit in general. I mean, most of the stuff I'm talking, it's all public, you know, uh, record, what have you. So it's not, but generally, uh, at least with this action, um, it has to do with some of the protesters during one of the protests where these um, some of the officers uh, used this uh, technique called uh, kenneling, and um, it made it hard for folks to be able to leave. So we're telling they're telling folks like, oh, you know, you're past the curfew. When there was a curfew, you have to go home, but they're not allowing them to be able to do so. And then oh, after wow. that, you know, things started to kind of like, um, you know, ratchet it, it up. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's scary it's, it's, as a protester, yeah. that's, that's scary yeah. to, you know, want to do something and, you know, just to kind of be corralled. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so those type of things, um, you know, so that's, so those, those are some of, some of the matters that we've been kind of dealing with, uh, uh, recently, you know, while, while doing the run as well. <laughs> and are you, uh, you know, just, I guess, housekeeping, are you 
like how is that working at the the law firm and uh, working out with the day to day of campaigning? Must be yeah, crazy. yeah. You know what I try to do my best. Well, actually, um, the short answer is probably terribly. <laughs> trying to figure out ways to do everything. So, you know, you try to, uh, you know, not be more than just a few minutes late to everything <laughs> that you're uh, trying to do. But, you know, usually what I try to do is, uh, you know, get up early, work on some of those uh, matters that I need to do. And then, uh, you know, try to really, um, you know, give my best effort for the rest of the day and uh, do everything I can to speak with voters. Uh, you know, whether it's certainly having conversations like this, whether it's uh, knocking on doors of folks in our community, uh, whether it's doing like, I, I mean, I think we just hosted our eighth um, food on distribution that we've had since the beginning of the pandemic, our pandemic, uh, beginning of the campaign, um, because a big part of it to me has also been that, you know, we want to talk about what our vision is for the future of our community. But at the same time, there are things we can do right now, you know, like today, right? And, uh, you know, I want to make sure that that's reflective in, you know, what it is um, that you know, we're, uh, you know, we're doing folks in our community. So how big a stretch is this? Like how, how big of a move does running for elected office um, mean to you right now? Like how, how big a move is it, does it represent for you? Um, so I, I guess, can you give me a look? So what do you mean by... So right now you're you're an attorney. You're working. Uh -huh. You were working for the attorney oh, general. You're, you're now you're working on civil rights cases. And so how how big a move does this represent, um, uh, running for office for you? Yeah, no, a big one. <laughs> is there is is it's a it's, you know in a lot of ways it's uh it's it's extremely different, right? Uh, than you know being in court, you know, and you know working on legal papers, you know, every day. Um, but at the same time, when it comes to like the mission and the values, it's, it's actually very, very similar. Um, you know, like I told you a little bit about my story um, as how, you know, the law and how education played a role. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed during my legal career is that, you know, there are all these attorneys, you know, that I've gotten to meet um, that are doing really great, positive, influential work. But I think to be able to take that next step to be able to eliminate some of those inequities and those disparities that I think that have really um, been challenges for um, folks of color for so long, it has to do with like making sure that we're tweaking these policies that have disproportionate impacts on us, right? And my thing, what I've really been learning and kind of one of the things that have made me think about doing this is that, you know, if we could be able to figure out a way to kind of tweak things when we're talking about criminal so we things when we're talking about housing rights or, or whatever the issue is, and then allow those folks who are advocates for folks in our community to be able to do the work and protect people, you know, it empowers them to empower us more. And, it's you know, one of, over your own community. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I couldn't have said it uh, better. And, uh, you know, in addition to being, uh, you know, uh, you know, my work, you know, as a, a practicing attorney, I also served as president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association for two years. And my underlying mission, my underlying thing is that I just wanted to make sure that we had forums and spaces where we're talking about like, what what are the root causes for some of the challenges that we see today? So what it's, are the root challenges in all these areas? So it's day one and you've gone from being a uh, candidate Clark to council member Clark. It's day one, you've been sworn in. What are you chomping at the bit? What piece of legislation can't you wait to start working on and to get passed? Oh man, um, that's a that's a really good question. So I think for me, it would definitely be um, related to education. And I think that the first thing I would wanna do is something I kind of been tinkering with is uh, making sure that, you know, we have, uh, you know, all right, so, uh, I, I guess the way I like to describe it is that there are all these issues um, like in a lot of our schools. And I think our parents know that they are, but they don't they don't work at the schools, right? They have and they also have jobs. They don't know specifically what it is that they're losing. What I would love to be able to see us do is have um, legislation out there that requires schools when there are certain violations of statutory required things, whether it's not having enough certified libraries, whether it's the classrooms uh, have too many people, whatever it is that's statutorily required that they're not that they haven't cured in 30, let's say 60 days. You know, then there's a notice that has to go out there to all the parents saying that that these things are issues. And my thinking with that 
is then it empowers the parents to be able to say, well, these are the things that are problems, right? And then they can be able to get advocates to be able to go out there and work for them. Because I've always, you know, again, maybe this is just my nature and my background with this, but I've always felt that if you could be able to use the law to really be able to push and champion for these issues, you know, that's how you can really be able to make a difference. But if you know, you know, there's no better champion that, you know, for some, or someone than, than their parents. Right. But if you don't know specifically what it is that's the problem, what you don't know what some other schools have that you don't, you just know that you have less, um, you know, you're at a disadvantage. So to the extent that we can be able to, especially for things that are statutory, I mean, that's like a, just a benchmark kind of thing. It's not something that's open to, um, you know, interpretation anyway, right. you know, maybe that way we can start. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And also helpful if you are, you know, an immigrant parent. You, you yes. Never had any experience with the with the public school system. Yeah, so. especially because like with some of the plans that you're supposed to have, there are certain um, services, especially for first time English language learners, that you're entitled to. Right. But if you aren't getting some of those things, you know, now you know. Now you know that you're supposed to get these things, and it's so not two years late or what have you. Yeah. That's your day one. So I've got another question, and just um, in very brief three very brief uh, answers. What are your top three, um, what do you see as the top three problems or issues in the district? So the first just, one- just what they are, no explanation. Okay, okay. got it, got it, got it. Uh, COVID recovery, right. um, housing, and I'll go with a quality of life, which includes public safety. <laughs> The quality of life slash public safety. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's take each one. Um, with COVID recovery, what's the problem and what's your solution? Yeah, well, the problem is that, you know, we need to recover. <laughs> and, um, you know, but it's one of those big sprawling things that have like impacted all these things. Um, you know, I, you know, before I start talking for another 20 minutes, you know, and I'll, I'll try to, you know, try to stay on point. So like, I wanna make sure that we're doing more when it comes to when we're recovering, making sure that we have more help, like healthcare resources. I think that's a reason why there is there was such a large impact on communities of color, especially because so many of us are essential workers. I think that we need to be able to do more for our small businesses so that they're getting the resources that they need, especially those that had to close their doors and really relied on having a storefront to be able to do their work. You know, and I think that this kind of goes to before, like, you know, with education that, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, we're, we have a plan out there so that our kids, especially the ones that, you know, have gotten, have fallen behind over this last year and a half, you know, have a real plan so that they can be able to move forward. Um, so that would be the COVID one. <laughs> That's COVID. Second right. was housing. Housing. The yes. problem and your solution. Yeah. So for housing, you know, one of the things I want to do is make sure that people stay in their homes because, you know, I just keep thinking the last time we had a recession in 2008, like Southeast Queens got hit harder than anywhere else in the entire country. It was like foreclosure central. And with the current recession and the pandemic, plus the 500,000 plus jobs we've lost since COVID started, uh, I think we have to be intentional about making sure that there are protections in place to protect folks from things such as to make sure folks who need to be able to finance have an opportunity, to ensure that we're looking like, like things just like our property tax system, to ensure that folks aren't, you know, folks in you know, like communities like ours, that their studies have shown that there is a, uh, that we're paying more than we're supposed to, that we can be able to get some of that funding back so that it's easier for people to be able to um, keep up with it. Um, so, so that would be uh, number two. <laughs> That's number two. And then number three was quality of life slash public safety. Problems yeah. and your solution. Right. Quality of life, you know, the first, you know, the thing I've heard from everyone is that I need more speed bumps, we need our roads uh, improved. And, you know, I think that what we need to do, and I recognize that, you know, city agencies, you know, they, I'm sure they get a lot of these requests, especially in, uh, in boroughs like ours, but I think that we need to make sure that city agencies are prioritizing communities like ours. You know, especially for some of these needs, because a lot of times I feel like we end up being real reactive as opposed to proactive. Um, so we wait until there is an accident, then maybe we need a speed bump or, or what have you. Um, but I guess to that point, when we're talking about, um, um, you know, public safety, you know, I want to make sure that we're ensuring that, you know, folks have the resources needed to be able to do well. Like I'm a big advocate of saying you can push for criminal justice reform. It's something that I, I was just telling you, we're, you know, we're doing now, but at the same time, you know, recognize that, you know, we need to have partnerships with our our local public safety so that people can feel safe. 
And I think that the way we do that is making sure that, you know, we're investing in, in the folks who are doing the work, making sure that, you know, response times are at a, um, you know, at points that are, that are appropriate, while at the same time, making sure that we're still pushing for more when it comes to police accountability, making sure good cops, you know, have the resource they need and bad cops, you know, aren't on the force and, uh, you know, are held accountable. What about recruitment? Uh, not, you know, not that as a city council member, mm -hmm. you, you know, you have a hands on in that, but, uh, but uh, would you do anything? Would you advocate for anything to be changed with police recruitment? Yes, I, I think it should be from New York City. I think folks, you know, who are recruiting should be New York City residents, um, because I think that um, part of what I think, uh, maybe I'm just kind of romanticizing some of this. Um, but there is this thought, you know, one day that, you know, you could be able to know, you know, your police officer and, and like, we know certainly some of them, you know, like our community affairs officers, what have you, but being able to know someone and someone who like has a respect for you as well. And I'm certainly not trying to make generalizations that, you know, if you don't come from New York city, you don't, but when it's your home, it's your home. Right. And, uh, I think that being able to instill that kind of intangible quality, that it's not a us versus you kind of thing but it's uh, a we kind of thing, you know, that's something that is harder to train, you know, if you like you know, training subjects. Um, but it's something that can be learned over a lifetime of, uh, uh, of you know, being a neighbor. And uh, I guess who knows you best? Who in this world knows you, Candidate Clark, best? Oh, that would definitely be my way. Yes. What's her name? What's your name? Yes, Nia, Nia Hale. Nia. You know, yes. Is it Nia or Nia? Uh, yeah, Nia as an N, N as a Nancy, N I A. Awesome. How long have yeah. you guys been married? Oh, uh, geez, sorry, I guess about. Oh, wait, that might be true. Yeah. Never ask a man <laughs> you your, your wedding it. anniversary or how long you've Jeez, been married. that's right. That's what that Google <laughs> alert is for. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to answer without, getting, without incriminating yourself, how long have you been married? Right, so it's been about two and a half years. Two and a half years. Um, fine. Okay. Well, it was in October. I'll do the math out there. Um, you know, we could cut this uh, interview right exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> with uh, with COVID, no one knows. Time has just been really. I'm gonna blame it on COVID. Time's been really weird with COVID. We don't know what year it is, so you get a pass on that one. But Nia, oh, yeah, your wife knows you best. That's awesome. Yes, she does. Yes, she does. Yeah. Now, I mean, I, I think that all my life I've been trying to figure out like you know, what it is, you know, like my, my purpose is and, you know, how I can make a difference. I think the way I feel that, you know, like my parents, you know, were able to make a difference. Like I'm a, I'm a big, you know, um, you know, um, you know, my father is really my hero in a lot of ways and just figuring out like what I'm going to be able to do for myself. And then, you know, one day I met uh, uh, Nia, whose name literally means purpose. Oh. And all of a sudden, I think, you know, everything started to kind of come into alignment. And, uh, you know, she makes me stronger and, uh, you know, she, she definitely knows me um, better than anyone. I love it. So here's my question about, about the lovely Nia. <laughs> um, uh, what would Nia say is your greatest strength? Oh, geez. Um, I, I think that what she would probably say is maybe my compassion. I think that's something I've heard her say. Uh, how so? Give us an example. Well, you know, I, I think maybe it's, you know, some of these things like, you know, wanting to become a uh, civil rights attorney, um, you know, wanting to do things like I started a, uh, a free tutoring and mentoring program called Dream Chasers. It's helped kids in our community get into some of the top high schools here in New York. Uh, you know, the work that we did with the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. You know, the whole reason I joined the AG's office is because of uh, Amadou Diallo and the AG's office being the only office back in 1999 that was doing anything on Stop and Chris. And I think that just through all of these things, you know, you know, I've just been trying to figure out a way to, um, you know, give back to others. And, you know, that's something that, um, you know, I think that, you know, she, she uh, and, and what would Nia <clears throat> uh, say is your greatest weakness? Oh, geez. Uh, Cleanliness. <laughs> Cleanliness. Oh my goodness. Knowing it's the like, problem is the first step. <laughs> well, I've been at this step for a minute. You know, clothes all over the place. You know, you know, I think anyone, you know, they'll say that, but then after a few years. <laughs> um, but uh, 
yeah, you know, making sure that, you know, the dishes get clean and everything right. like that. So I think that's definitely something that um, uh, would definitely make, um, you know, the top one. <laughs> top of our list. So candidate Clark, it is four years from now and you've spent four years, let's say, it, as uh, the city council member. How would we measure your success? How would we measure your progress in four years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, for me, you know, if I was fortunate enough to win, you know, one of the things I would want to, I would do is um, put together a plan of saying, these are the things that we want to do in these particular buckets and, you know, really memorialize that these are the things that we're going to be fighting for. You know, many of the things that frankly you can be able to see, uh, you know, on our website right now. And I want to make sure that that's out there and that, you know, we're holding, you know, holding myself or whoever there is accountable to that. Um, because, you know, I think that it's very easy uh, to be able to say, you know, I, you know, you want to fight for this and you want to fight for that. But um, I want to make sure that, you know, when you're talking about legislation, you know, when you're talking about community based organizations that, you know, are being empowered to be able to do work through, you know, let's say discretionary funding or whatever, when you're talking about the stances you take when it comes to um, uh, approving or not approving budgets that don't have or do have, you know, the resources needed to make sure that your community can be able to do well. Because I know for me, you know, one of the things that's always been frustrating is when folks say like, I'm gonna do A, B, and C, but we didn't get the funding. So what are we gonna do about it? You know, that's, you know, maybe we'll fight for it next time. Like, I don't want that, especially, you know, for me, if I, you know, have the uh, for, you know, good fortune uh, and the privilege to be the next uh, council member to be an excuse. I feel like then what it means is you got to start putting your thinking cap on. How do we figure out other ways to be able to get that? How do we figure out another way to be able to get to that actual outcome? After that? So I really want, um, you know, it's, you know, so I, I, that's clear, but also in some ways I think kind of um, vague, but I, I guess hopefully I'm giving the, the feeling that I want to make sure that, you know, in all of these areas that we're talking about, let's say, you know, we're talking about COVID, like we're talking about quality of life, we're talking about housing, that after four years, you know, folks can be able to appreciably be able to say that, you know, yeah, things are, you know, at least moving in the right direction. Frankly, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I want it to be more than that. I want folks to be able to feel empowered and be able to say like, yes, this is, this is just the start. And now we see, you know, what it is that, you know, we're, we're capable of. All right. Um, well, we're just about out of time, so I wanted to give you a few moments to ask to answer uh, my final question, which is, uh, candidate Jason Clark. First of all, thanks so much for sitting down or standing up with us today. <laughs> I really appreciate yeah. it. And uh, my last question is, um, why should we, the voters of Council District Twenty Seven, cast our vote for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's probably the uh, probably the most important question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess all I can say is that for me, it's just that, you know, like I believe in our future. Uh, I believe that, you know, despite the challenges that we've been dealing, whether it's with COVID, the recession, all the social unrest that, you know, we've been dealing with, you know, for, for so long, that, you know, the best is yet to come for us. But that only happens if, you know, we're thoughtful and that we come together with a plan of action so that so many of these issues that we've been dealing with for so long, you know, we can have a different outcome there. And, uh, you know, for me, I like to think that, you know, my experience, whether it was, uh, my experience as an attorney, whether at the attorney general's office, you know, being able to find um, solutions to, um, to complex issues, whether it's the leadership that I like to be able to say that I've been able to um, convey during my time at the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, or whether it's just the community work that we've done, you know, right here in uh, in Southeast Queens, you know, with uh, Dream Chasers, you know, being able to get kids in our community right now to have a better um, education and future for themselves. You know, I feel like with all of those things that, um, you know, maybe I can help. Okay, maybe I can help. We like that. Thanks so much, Jason Clark. Uh, thank you, Gail. Clark for taking some time out and sitting down with us this afternoon. On behalf of everyone at A Better Jamaica, thank you so much for sitting down and uh, best of luck to you in the campaign. Great, thank you, Gail. All right. Thanks for everyone here at A Better Jamaica. Thanks so much everyone for watching and we will see you again real soon.